calm down. <laughs> well, down to a low roar. If you were here this morning in our Bible study class, I'm going to run through some things real quick that I shared this morning. Some of you are here tonight that weren't here this morning, but we're in Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, one thing that we mentioned about it, it it was written 700 years before the birth of Christ, but it's written in the past tense. And so uh, the reason... And that in itself is a something unusual, that something would be written that far ahead of the Messiah and be written in the past tense. But there are very good reasons for why it is. When we read it today, of course, we're looking back on the cross and the resurrection, so it seems quite natural to us. But to the Jews reading it in that day, it would have been very unnatural because it is something that hadn't yet happened yet to them, but they're reading it in the past tense. We've said this morning that one of the reasons it is written probably in the past tense is that in the day that Christ returns to the Mount of Olives, that the Jews will see him, realize that he is a true Messiah, And when they see him and realize he is a true Messiah, their mind is going to go back to Isaiah chapter 53 because Isaiah chapter 53 actually is not only a prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ, but it is also a list, a litany, if you will, of the sins of Israel in rejecting the Messiah. And so we see this both ways when we look at Isaiah chapter 53. And as we said this morning, it says, it begins with who has believed our message or our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. And so it begins with that very statement. Uh, To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed and who will believe our message? And so we gave an outline this morning as we, we, we wanted to have an overview of the whole thing, except this morning I don't have much time, so I didn't go through individual scriptures this morning. So tonight I have time to go through individual scriptures, and so when we look at Isaiah 53 then, we says we asked this morning what the theme of this is, and the theme of it is in Isaiah 53, is suffering. You see Christ suffering. And in the fourth verse of the 53rd chapter, it says, Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we can consider him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. And in verse 5, he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities, and by his wounds we are healed. And so it goes on to say in verse 8, we are all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So in those verses of Scripture, we see a tremendous amount of suffering that has taken place in Christ. Not enough that We see him smitten and struck by the Romans, but we see that God allowed it, and we see him, God laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of our sins were laid on him. That's why he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if it be your will, Father, if it be your will, let this cup, cup of wrath, pass from me because he knew what was coming. And nevertheless, thy will be done, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
So the, the, the theme that we see all the way through the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a tremendous amount of suffering that Christ went through uh, on the cross and before his accusers there when he was crucified. Now then the next thing we see, next question we ask, was, was this suffering deserved? And if you look at verse 9 of the 53rd chapter, it says he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. In other words, he was totally innocent. He was totally innocent. And so we see that he did not deserve, we deserved what he went through, but he went through it for us. So we see here in 53rd chapter of Isaiah, the Bible states that he, he did not deserve what he went through. We did, but he did that for us. And that's what we see. The next question that we asked this morning was, was it a failure on God's part not to protect his son? And uh, in verse 5 and 6, it answered that. He was pierced what? For our transgressions. In other words, it was necessary in God's plan for Jesus to be the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, number one, because he was the only one that could be the sacrifice for our sins because he never sinned. And so he was the God-man. So he could, he died in our place taking on our punishment and the wrath of God that should have been on us was poured out on him. Okay. Now, the next question we asked was, why should, why should, why should a man do that? Why should a man do that? And in verse 10 and 12, it said, because it was the Lord's will. Verse 10 says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, now this is where it comes into play. He will see his offspring, Christ, and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So we see then that it, although it was God's will for him to suffer, it was also God's will that he be exalted above every name and that he be high and lifted up and seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what we see when we look at that. So those were questions we answered this morning, but I didn't really have time to go through the scriptures in the 53rd uh, chapter there as well. Next question we ask, well, what is the outcome of all this? And in verse 11, 13 through 13, and then 15, uh, that question is answered. It says in verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will what? Will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I have given him a portion among what? The great. And he will divide spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So that's the answer to that question. What is the outcome? The outcome is you and I have been saved. He will justify many. And so we have been saved because he poured out his life as a sacrifice uh, to, the, to the Father for the sins of the people. And so we see that here written out in plain view in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah as well. And something that we mentioned before was, and the question we asked this morning well, could anyone else have done this? And the answer is no. There's no one else that could have done this. 
because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You say, what about an angel? Well, an angel can't represent man because he is not human. It had to be a man and it had to be one that had never sinned and the only one is Christ himself that could be the sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of God so that he might be just and the justifier of those who are lost. So he is both just, he has punished our sin in his son Jesus Christ, and he's a justifier. He has justified us through our faith and repentance in Christ Jesus. Therefore now there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ. So he's just and he's a justifier. And he could only do that through his son, Jesus Christ. So we see all that right here in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And as I said this morning, there was a, a man that wrote a, who is over the Chosen People Ministries, that wrote a book about that. And I do have his name here. His name was Mitch Glazer, G-L-A-S-E-R. And he wrote a book called The Gospel According to Isaiah 53. The Gospel According to Isaiah 53. And that's very interesting because he is a completed Jew. And chosen people is a ministry to the Jews, both in America especially and in other places as well. And so I mentioned Barry Berger, a man that we supported as a missionary who was a part of Chosen People Ministry. And he came here and he did the Passover and other uh, different type of, uh, of different uh, religious uh, events that happened in the life of Israel. He did it in our church and we went through it with him. And so now he's in Arizona and he is in ministry there to lost Jews in Arizona and has a church there in, in Arizona. And so it ties in with what we see here. So in other words, the Jews, when they see Christ, are going to look back to Isaiah chapter 53 and they recognize him as a true Messiah. The first thing that's going to come to mind is Isaiah 53 he is the one we crucified. This is the one, and he is the true Messiah. And this is how we rejected him. This is our sins, and they will repent and be saved. Now then, uh, I don't know where to throw this in at, so I'm going to do it right here. Uh, we're going to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And you've got all the minor prophets. You've got Jonah, and then you've got Nahum, then you've got Habakkuk, and right after that is Zechariah. And we're going to Zechariah chapter 14, and what we see is this is the time when all the nations of the world have surrounded Jerusalem, Israel and Jerusalem, and is about to destroy them, that Jesus Christ's second coming to earth is going to take place. This is different than the rapture. In the rapture, he's not coming to earth. He's coming in the sky, and the Bible says in Thessalonians, we shall be caught up to meet him in the air. He's not coming to earth. In this scripture, the 14th chapter of Zechariah, he's coming to the earth. And this is when the Jews will be saved. And so it says in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, a day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. And by the way, let me say this. The world has never been more negative on Israel than where they are today because of what's happened in Gaza. The world in particular has never been more negative on Israel 
than they are today. Many people today across the world are pro-Palestinian. And one of the reasons is because of what's happened. And then to top it all off were these people that were distributing food that were targeted and killed by the Israel, Israeli army. That sent it over the top. And so we live in a day and a time today when anti-Semitism is very great in our world in which we live today. So it wouldn't take much more, too many steps, for the world to be gathered against Israel. NATO's already gathered against Israel. And so what we see here as prophecy, we see how it could happen. Fourteen. The day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it, and the city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. And half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day his feet will land or stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. Now this is an actual mountain uh, east of Jerusalem. And it says on that day, it was uh, years ago, <coughs> I'm trying to think of the name of the magazine that reported it, but Holiday Inn wanted to build a hotel there at Jerusalem. And so they sent out uh, their uh, engineers to that area. And they came back with a port, report. And they said, you can't, build a, you can't build a hotel there. And they said, well, why can't we build a hotel there? And they said, because there's a fault that runs right down the middle of the mountain and one day that mountain is going to split to the east and to the west. But if they'd read scripture, they'd know that because it's prophesied here in Zechariah chapter 14 when his feet land on the Mount of Olives. This is what it says. It says it will be split in two from the east to the west forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley for it will extend to Azil. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. That's us. On that day there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. And when evening comes, there will be light. It's going to be a day different than any other day. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea, half to the western sea, in summer and in winter. And the Lord will be king over the whole earth and on that day there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. So here in Zechariah chapter 14, uh, we, we have this uh, prophecy given that we're talking about and, and that will happen. And so this is what we see when we, we uh, look at the uh, chapter 53 in the book of Isaiah that they will see Christ coming. And uh, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 11, verse 25. He says in 
Romans chapter 11, verse 25, I do want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brother, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Then it says, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godless away from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So you see, this is a promise of that day when the sins of Israel will be forgiven. And Isaiah chapter 53 is what they will look back to and recognize their sins in that day, I believe. I believe that's why it was written in the past tense, although it was written 700 years before Christ was ever born. So when we look at that, that's, that's pretty awesome. When we look, I, I can't remember who I was talking to this morning, but I was, might have been Brigitte, it might have been somebody else. I, I think I can't remember what I had for breakfast. But I was saying how interesting, once again, how accurate God is in giving us the scriptures. That 700 years before the Messiah would ever be born, he writes Isaiah 53 in the past tense, and one day Israel will look back to it and say, yes, that was us, and repent of their sins and be saved. And so I'm going back to Isaiah 53 now. I didn't make it that far. I'll get to this later. I got another thing marked here. I'm not going to get to that yet, though. Okay. Because what we see, well, let's ask this question. Why didn't the Jews look at Isaiah 53 when Christ was crucified and recognize that and say, this must be the Messiah. Number one, they did not believe they needed a Savior. Number two, they were looking for a king to deliver them from the Romans and to alleviate their bondage and their misery. They did not, in other words, they did not see their own sin. Why don't they believe today? They still don't see their own sin. Why is it that so many people are not saved today? They still don't see their own sin. Most people today are not looking for a savior. They're looking for somebody to get them out of whatever trouble they've gotten themselves into. That's what they're looking for. It's sort of like your house is on fire. You're, look, you're looking for a fireman. And so most most of our world today does not believe in the Messiah. And the reason they don't believe in the Messiah is because they don't think they need one. And they never will until God breaks through and convicts them of their own sin. Because you've got to be convicted of your sin before you know you need a Savior. And that's the great problem. Most of the religions in the world today, they're not looking for a Savior. They think they're okay. They don't recognize their own sinfulness. 
So we live in a world today of egomaniacs marching their way to hell in their sin because they do not recognize the need for a Savior. Because when you recognize you need a Savior, it's because God has broken into your life and convicted you of your sin, and you will turn to the Savior. So this is the world we live in today. But as we read here in Romans... There's a day coming when Israel will repent when it sees Christ coming and landing on the Mount of Olives and they will go back to Isaiah chapter 53. And that brings us to the last part of our study. Uh, Yes, ma'am. in hell except for the completed Jews yes 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 take it up with God (laughs) that's my answer to that because it doesn't clarify. Doesn't clarify. But is it? You could take it two ways. It doesn't say all those in Israel will be saved. It says all of Israel will be saved. You could take that to mean those that had fled as well. Matthew chapter 24, 25. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going over to uh, Isaiah chapter 59. And this ties in with what we read in Zechariah 14. And uh, Isaiah 59 beginning in the 16th verse. And he says, speaking of the Lord, and he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one, no man to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. He, capital he, put on the righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head, he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west men will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun they will revere his glory. For he will come... Just like we read there in Zechariah, he will come like a pent up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer, quote, will come to Zion, that's Jerusalem, Israel. The Redeemer will come to Zion, and those in Jacob, Israel, who repent of their sin, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. And that goes right along with what we read there in Zechariah chapter 14. The Redeemer is coming. 
And from that time on, not only the people that are in Israel at that time, or Israel in that time, but their descendants from that time on and forever will be with the Lord. I'm waiting. I ain't got a question. They already are, and the rest of them, their descendants will be saved, according to Isaiah 59. Don't look at me, I didn't write it. <laughs> Okay, now then, we got to work through the rest of this. All right. Yeah. No, that's during the tribulation. We're talking about the millennium. Yeah. Because you've got the rapture, you, you, you've got the rapture, you've got the tribulation, and then you've got him coming to the Mount of Olives. Yeah. That is if you're a pre-trib rapture believer. <laughs> okay. Now then, let me get... All right, now, we, we've got to part of this this morning, but these are reasons that we find here in the 53rd chapter of uh, Isaiah that they, they, that they rejected Christ as a Messiah. Number one, we said, was his origin. He, he did not come from royalty. They did not recognize him in the lineage of David. They should have. But he did not come from royalty. He came from, from uh, Joseph and Mary. And so we see that, and he was born in a stable. He was born, he was born in, in Bethlehem, which is an insignificant place. Born in a stable, probably in a, laid in a pig trough or a hog trough. Uh, as a manger, and so he did not have a kingly origin that he came from. And that's what we read here in 53, verse 2. He grew up before them like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. And we said this morning that when you look at the Hebrew word for that, like a root out of dry ground, a, a a tender shoot is talking about a uh, sucker branch, we would call it today, that comes on a tomato plant or a, or a tobacco plant or whatever, that, and it, they would just break it off and throw it away. In other words, they saw him, Jesus, as in, totally insignificant, not from royalty. His origin was not that which would make them think in other words, he didn't fit what they thought the king would be. You know, there's a lot of people that aren't saved today because Jesus doesn't fit what their own idea of who God is. They've got their own God made up in their minds, and if if God doesn't, if the God that we read about in Scripture doesn't fit their thinking then they just reject it. Well, God is not the God that you think he is in your head. God is the God that is revealed in Scripture. And that's the problem. And so that's what we see. That's a lot of people's problem today. They got an idea of who God is in their mind. Well, the Scriptures doesn't line up with the idea they got in their mind. Debbie.
Uh-huh. Right, but here it's talking about because he was beaten, and yeah, in Isaiah 53, is that where you are? Yeah, uh huh, that's what it said. Uh, there is no scripture that says Jesus Christ was a gosh awful, handsome, tall, strong man. Saul, there is. That's what they were looking for. I think in one of the Psalms it describes his appearance almost the same way that uh, Isaiah 53 does. Yeah. So I, I, I think if we saw Jesus in a crowd, he would look ordinary. And I think that's on purpose. I think he, he did not draw attention to himself as that's one reason he wasn't didn't come from royalty. He did not declare himself to be king. Don't y'all fight back there, be nice. Somebody Charlie, go back and sit between Sheila and Debbie. <laughs> it's rough. You folks watching online don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> okay. That's, another thing is his family was ordinary and his followers were ordinary. You just think about who Jesus called out to be his disciples. There, there wasn't a priest among them. There wasn't a rabbi. There wasn't somebody of hierarchy among them. They were just ordinary people like us. Just ordinary people. And so the Jews looked at that and they said, well, look at his followers. Look who his disciples are. Well, they're just ordinary people. Well, if he was a king, wouldn't he have an entourage? Wouldn't he have this? Wouldn't he? Again, they have it made up in their minds what they were looking for instead of who God sent. And that's the problem in that day, and that's a problem today with a lot of people. Okay. I ain't got time to read all that. And that brings us to something else which has already been bought up by Debbie and that is his appearance. His appearance was nothing special. You know, like we mentioned, Saul. Saul was, a, they said, Scripture tells us that he was a tall, handsome man. Nowhere does it say in Scripture that Jesus was a tall, handsome man. I think he would have been ordinary. And I think that's purposeful. And I think that they were look again, they were looking for something other than what God sent, who God sent. And that's what most of our world is today. They're not looking for, a, they want, here's what they want. They want Jesus Christ, if he's a Messiah, to take away their problems. But they don't want Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to be Lord of their life. They want to go do what they want to do and him tell them it's all right. That's the kind of Savior they're looking for. Well, I got news for you. He don't exist. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And so that's what a lot of people's problem is today when we look at that. I got to go. I'm going through this, so I won't skip anything. The last reason that we see and we look at here is how it ended up. Uh, look, let's read verse 5. He was despised and rejected by men. 
That word despise is a strong word. They counted him, it's like saying they counted him as a nobody. He was not even important to them. He was absolutely unimportant to them. They could care less about him. That's the attitude that they had. In fact, when he did that sign, did say that he was, I am, and that he was the king. And by the way, in studying this, the, the hierarchy of the Jews actually blackmailed Pilate into crucifying Christ or they would send a report to Caesar about what he had done. Well, so what did Pilate do to get back at them? Well, he knew how much they hated Christ claiming to be their king. So what did he put on the cross above his head? King of the Jews. Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. So he got back at them for what they had threatened to do. So he had put up on the cross above his head so that every Jew could see, this is your king. And they absolutely despised it. They hated it. And that's what it says here. They despised him and rejected him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Look at this, like one from whom men hide their faces. They didn't even want to look at him. He was despised. He said it again. And what? We esteemed him not. We didn't even want to look at him and we lived as though he did not exist. We esteemed him not. This tells you what, how, what level of a hatred they had for him claiming to be their king. If he was our king, he, he, he would have been born from royalty. If he was our king, he wouldn't have been born in Nazareth. If he was our king, he would have looked different. If he was our king, uh, he wouldn't be nailed to this cross, I'll tell you that. If he was our king, he would have delivered us from the Romans. That's what he would have done. And on and on and on and on and on. So they, you see what their mindset was. And it's all spelled out here in Isaiah 53 when, when, we, when we look at that. And so that's what we see when we look at the scripture here. Okay? Okay, here's another thing I found out. The word for Jesus is Yeshua. Y-E-S-H-U-A. That's the Hebrew word for Jesus, Yeshua. They changed, they changed his name to Yeshu. Y-E-S-H-U, without the A. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? His name be blotted out. They wanted him blotted out. They wanted his name to be blotted out. That's how much they despised him. See, you, you, you think back to that day and what they were looking for and what the Pharisees had told them. That's hard for us to swallow as a Christian. But that was their mindset. And it's all spelled out here in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah as we look at it. Okay? I got 15 minutes. Well, I've said this before. That I've got it underlined, underlined, underlined. He did not fit their picture of who a king would be. All right, let's see. Acts 
Acts chapter 3, verse 17. Verse 13. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. What's Acts chapter 3, verse 13? This is, this is Peter's sermon that he preached. And we're going to begin in verse 13 of the third chapter of Acts. And if you want to understand, let me go back up and I'll get it all in context. You understand who he's speaking to. While the verse 11 of the third chapter, while the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in one place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power of godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate. Though he had decided to let him go, you disowned the holy and the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, he says, now brothers, well, he's speaking to them as other Israelites. I know that you acted in ignorance as, you did, your, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sin may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets." So this was Peter's sermon that he preached to them on the day that this man was healed on the colonnade. What? Oh, she's talking on her phone. (laughs) Okay. All right, has everybody got that now? You see, this is a very... Took a lot of a lot of uh, eternal fortitude for Peter to stand up and preach this sermon to them when they were all gathered around him on the colonnade there in front of them after this man was healed. I mean, he preached a heck of a sermon, and this is exactly he's telling them the truth when we we see it uh, in the scriptures here as, as we look at it. Okay, all right. Now then. I'm just about through. More ways than one. <laughs> Has anybody got a question? A good question. That's one I can answer. Yeah, and Jesus. It was a name used for him. Uh huh. The Jewish leaders, especially, they actually wanted. That's what they wanted. They wanted his name blotted out. They actually hated him for claiming to be their king, and they especially hated him when he claimed to be like the father. So we see in 53rd chapter of Isaiah so many things come to light out of the scriptures there. Not just Christ being crucified and how he paid the price for our salvation, 
but we see into the mind of the Jewish people at that time and how they rejected Christ as well. And so we see a lot of things when we look at Isaiah 53 there, okay? All right, we're going to go offline now.